Hola y gracias por acompañarnos esta noche. Mi nombre es Espo y soy el coordinador del programa del Comité de Práctica Abierta, el programa de artistas visitantes en el Departamento de Artes Visuales de la Universidad de Chicago. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Espo and I'm the program coordinator for the Open Practice Committee, the visiting artist program in the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Chicago. El evento de esta noche se presenta en asociación con el Festival Lee and Luz. Le agradecemos todos sus tremendos esfuerzos para facilitar el evento de esta noche y el festival de este año. Asegúrense de revisar la programación completa que continuará diariamente hasta el próximo viernes. Tonight's event is presented in partnership with the Lit and Loose Festival. We thank you for all your tremendous efforts in facilitating tonight's event and this year's festival. Please be sure to check out their entire virtual schedule, which will continue daily through this upcoming Friday. El Departamento de Artes Visuales también reconoce que nuestro evento de esta noche, número 175, del Comité de Práctica Abierta, tiene lugar en las tierras tradicionales del Consejo de Tres Hogueras, las naciones Ojibwe, Odawa, y Potawatomi. The Department of Visual Arts also acknowledges that our event tonight, number 175 of the Open Practice Committee, takes place on the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. Aunque cada uno de nosotros nos reunimos aquí hoy virtualmente desde distintos lugares, nuestro campus permanece entre un rastro de búfalo histórico y un gran cuerpo de agua. Ahora como entonces, esta tierra es un sitio de comercio, reunión y residencia para muchas personas. Reconocemos como nuestras carreteras, líneas de trenes y autopistas actuales deben un linaje a esta infraestructura temprana así como el poder histórico de la institución para desplazar a varios de, le, de los que se han establecido aquí y le han llamado a esta tierra circundante su hogar. Although we each gather here today virtually from distinct locations, our institution and campus remains situated between a historic Buffalo Trail and a great body of water. Now as then, this land is a site of trade, gathering, and residence for many people. We acknowledge how our current roads, train lines, and expressways owe a lineage to this early infrastructure, as well as the historic power of the institution in displacing a number of those who have settled here and have called the surrounding land home. Ya sea al comentar sobre la ley fronteriza de México y Estados Unidos, la desigualdad de género, la teoría científica, o los derechos de los trabajadores. Tania Candiani crea objetos y acciones que provocan empatía, nostalgia crítica y reflexión sobre la mercantilización del tiempo, la tierra y el trabajo. Whether commentating on U.S. border, on U.S. Mexico border law, gender inequality, scientific theory, or workers' rights, Tania Candiani creates objects and actions that provoke empathy, critical nostalgia, and reflection on the commodification of time, land, and labor. Su trabajo ha sido exhibido en museos, instituciones, y espacios independientes alrededor del mundo, incluyendo la Bienal de Venecia, donde representó a México. Her work has been exhibited in museums, institutions, and independent spaces across the globe including the 56 Venice Biennale, where she represented Mexico. Por favor, acompáñeme en darle la bienvenida a Tania Candiani. Please join me in welcoming Tania Candiani. Thank you, Sespo. Um, I don't know if I'm online already. I'm not able to, to see myself, but Thank you very much for this invitation to the festival Lit and Loose. Um, this introduction, Sespo, was was uh, beautiful. Um, well, um, tonight I want to present a selection of work um, based in 
three lines, which is uh, labor, something that I call uh, the choreography of labor, uh, which considerates the beauty of the process of the manual process itself. And I want to start with this image because um, I lived in in the border in Tijuana, in the border between the city of Tijuana and San Diego for 15 years. Um, it was a very important place for me because it's a place where I um, grew up as an artist and a place that in Spanish, that's, I said, el lugar donde me hice, the place where I became who I am as an artist and as a person as well. I live in Mexico City now, but those years over there in the border uh, just gave me all the um, influence and the power and the freedom to create in several directions, which is the, the way my work goes. Um, Tijuana has a very interesting thing, which is, it is um, completely mixed. I, I think I will call it a city of remix. Everything go comes and forward and nothing is less important or one side or the other one. Everything is interweave. Um, so um, um, when I lived over there, which was um, 12 years ago, I know more, 25 years ago, let's say, there was no art school in Tijuana. So um, uh, I am a um, um, self-taught artist. I, um, I decided to move to Tijuana when I was 20 years old. I moved over, the, over there um, being a writer. And um, as a writer, I was um, invited to write an article about the artistic scene in Tijuana. And that's how I get in touch with many of the, the artists, which now are my contemporary uh, fellows. They were very generous and immediately um, I understood there was this very interesting way of interacting between disciplines. There was no art school, so there were no um, um, formal education system or an art system as, as like that. So there was no rules for anything. There was no traced rules at all. Uh, so the first things I, I did was, um, I was invited to be part of an art collective, Revolucionarte, it was the name. And um, we were a group of painters and uh, engraver, people doing engraving, uh, musicians, um, some people doing VJ and, all that things interact and create events. So for me, um, understanding how to create art was this idea of mixing a palette of knowings uh, and of knowledge. Um, I wanna start with this piece and then I maybe we'll come back with an anecdote that I really like about the first time I work with someone that was not an artist, uh, it was, a uh, a guy who did uh, upholstery, but uh, upholstery, I hope, I hope it's that the right word. Well, this is the, the wall that divided Tijuana from San Diego in a, in a Colonia Libertad. Um, most of the time is in this state. It's, it's a very sad image because what represents. So um, before leaving Tijuana, I'm coming uh, back to Mexico City. That was in 2008. I decided to create this series of pieces, which is called Reinterpretación de Paisaje, which means um, landscape reinterpretation. So for that series, um, I made several different installations trying to change the landscape of the border. So in this case, um, I cover the wall with a bunch of uh, material that was disposed around the area. So car parts mostly and parts of the same wall. And uh, we, we made this uh, one only day piece, um, putting all this kind of horizon 
um, and painted with with paint, paint painting the landscape with uh, um, in this moment of uh, recreation of a, of a, of a beautiful landscape. This this is a, another piece from the same year, which is called Toque de Valla. And it consisted in a performance action. Um, as you can see, um, the border goes directly into the water. Um, it's very hardcore and disrupting. Um, so I decided to create this piece and I decided to show this piece now because I was already working with sound and I didn't knew that. So the only sound I have recorded is what we just heard. Um, this was not recorded in video and the piece consisted in, um, in a performance with uh, three war bands uh, coordinated but one only director which is quite strange because most of the time the bands has their own their director and actually they are always fighting between them um, and they were playing different hits um, to attack or or guard the border and there was a bunch of volunteers in the beach that, that helped us to um, elevate those ladder um, and create this kind of uh, attempt to cross the border. Um, I'm going to the next one. And I wanted to show that because Tijuana is important for me and how everything changed over there in matters of understanding this um, way of working between, between media. Uh, this piece is a very recent piece it's from this year. It's called Camouflage, but it's based as well in the border. The, this piece was made in, in Freeze, LA, but it rescues this image, which is um, a photo uh, from the photographer, photographer, American photographer, Dorothea Lang. Um, she documented the, the um, Japanese American uh, incarcerated or concentration camps. It's not. Uh, very uh, common to call it concentration camps, but this is where they were. Uh, so along the um, along California, in many places like Manzanares, they were installed these camps where women were forced to work, creating these camouflage nets uh, for the Americans that were fighting against the Japanese. Um, it was forced labor for free, um, and in my intention remaking this piece be, uh, um, was there were two intentions. One, just to bring back that part of the history, which is not very well known for many people in in California or in the United States. It's, there's something that in the schools there is not is not typically teach in the schools. Uh, as part of the history of California. Missions, yes, but this part, no. Um, and as well, because it creates a reference to the, to the conditions of the, of the current migrants in the, in the detention camps in the border, which are forced to work for free. So... Um, I always I work a lot uh, based in based in archives. So in this case, the work literally uh, start from this uh, photo. So I recreate um, as closer as possible the installation of the um, of the um, frames for the nets. And the piece consists in this performance during four days, where a group of women were uh, weaving the the, the nets. As well, it happens that as a textile, um, it is a very beautiful piece as well. So it's it's contradictory at the same time. So it has this beautiful look, which helps the people to come in and ask what it's about. And then it's 
um, the piece. So can we see the first video, please? Um, John, can you play the first video, please? I think we're having some issues, Tanya. Let's, um, okay. Okay, well, um, this is um, as well a project that I uh, did, I finished it in, in 2020, actually is now on view in the center, in the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. It's a project that I, uh, that took us two and a half year to complete um, and started with, um, with um, with several visits to Cincinnati and a research based in a book that I found in doing a residency in the Smithsonian archives in the National Museum of American History. Um, I was doing a research on world exhibitions and the connection of those exhibitions with the industry and the story of technology. Um, I'm very uh, interested in the archaeology of media, and in the full, in a couple of in a projects at the end of the presentation, I will speak um, specifically about that. But um, I found this book that um, uh, was amazing because I was I was already invited to have this uh, solo exhibition, and in the in these reports there are several books of the of the reports of the. Cincinnati Industrial Exposition, which uh, happens um, for 15 years in a moment in the United States where uh, Ohio was still trying to become the industrial uh, state of America. So um, um, it's very interesting how the country uh, was shaping during those times and how not not just America, but all the countries in those moments were trying to became become modern and uh, embracing as well a bit of their traditions. So, taking a look of these pages, I realized that I wanted to work precisely um, 
bringing um, uh, into the discussion the way the industry uh, shine and then start disappearing. So I found in, in this book and in several other books, this kind of illustrations and many uh, written explanation of the lines of production of many kinds of industries that now are, are not disappear, they are, not, they, are, they are still exist, but the processes completely change. So everything is about the process and the sound of the process. I, as, I, I, as I mentioned it before, I'm interested in choreography of, of labor, but as well how the, how the processes of labor sound. So I came up with the idea of creating a piece which consists in making with the voice the sound of old industries. Um, so for that, um, I um, was looking for a choir and I, had, I was super lucky to get in touch with the Muse Women Choir from Cincinnati. They are a very uh, political engaged group. Uh, all the repertoire is based in, in songs and lyrics um, which are very feminist and social um, engaged. Um, so uh, the first time I, I present the idea to the director, she was uh, very excited. She said yes immediately, but then I, 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 I had to find a way to translate into, music, into a musical scores these ideas. Because for me, I had in mind to create, to recreate the sound of an industry uh, in my mind um, was very clear. But from that to creating a score that was easy to read for a director was um, quite challenging. I work with a composer in Mexico City, a friend of mine that I worked before with him, Rogelio Sosa, and as well with many people. This is a very big project, all sounding labor, um, silent bodies. It's a project uh, with um, several pieces, eight pieces in total and with many collaborations. And in, in the case of the video, the Four Industries video, um, I wanted the cameras, for example, the photographers that were recording the whole video to do with, their, with the movement of the camera, the movement of the old um, machines. So for example, the printing press, do always this kind of movement, which is the chika, 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 chika. So the camera needs to do that same movement. So we have, um, I work with a production um, uh, uh, company from um, Cincinnati. Uh, a big production was, I have uh, some more images over here, here. Um, and we record the whole thing in three days, which was uh, quite challenging. But the, 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 the biggest challenge was that the COVID uh, came in and then I had to edit at home. So um, edit a video piece, it's, it's good, but editing a, five, a, a, a quadraphonic audio piece was super challenging. There was no way for me to hear the sound as it's supposed to work in the gallery. And until, until this moment, I haven't been able to visit the place. So there's a, a lot of challenging in, in working from home when you are doing a project in, of this uh, category. This is the, the, the one, one shot of the installation in the museum. Uh, I like very much to work with this this position of the screen in the space. I use it very often. The first time was in a project which is called, uh, is called Pausa, no, Pulso. Uh, Pulso is as well a three channel video, but the two screens are in angle. In that way, um, everything is like around you, like embrace you. So um, uh, can we play the second video, please? Thank <laughs> you. 
We are waiting for the video. Okay, um, one more piece that I want to uh, mention about this exhibition, it's a uh, working woman. Um, this piece is, um, uh, the inspiration is the photograph in black and white that we are looking at the left, which are uh, photos from, uh, nine, um, from, 1920, from 1929, yes, 1929. Um, from the artist will not will not rise. These photos were the um, based of a series of murals which um, are made in made in mosaics, and they were doing in 1932 in Cincinnati as well. But as you can see in the photo, there's a woman worker in the in working over there, and the mural um, just eliminate her. And several of the murals, uh, in the several of the murals occurs the same. There were a lot of female workers during those days, and they were not portrayed here. So, I my intention with this piece is return uh, and or uh, make visible the work of the women during that period. So the piece consists in the remaking of the mural in a factory in Cincinnati that was um, um, fabricated in uh, the Rockwood Pottery, which is a company founded in 18, in 1880 by a woman. Um, she was a very prominent art pottery uh, pro production in the United States. Um, this piece, I think, encapsulates the um, the focus of the exhibition in the um, historic manufacturing and the way the um, the women are under recognizing everywhere. Uh, this is a detail of the of the mosaic that just came up uh, last week. Um, everything has been just delayed over this month, so I'm super excited to show this piece for the first time. Um, the following piece is uh, Sirene. Sirene, uh, written like that, is Sirene or Siren in Polish language. This piece uh, was made in 2018 in Dansk, a city of, Pol of Poland. And the point of departure of this idea is um, um, there's a city in Dansk which is called Novi Port, which means new port, uh, but it's not actually the new port, uh, that port became obsolete and a very, very super modern um, new port. It's now in other city uh, um, 
far away from this one. And what happened with the city, the city started to dry. It started to die. Um, so my idea was to try to call back the life of the city uh, through the through the voice. I think this is the 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 mother of for industries piece in a, in the way that I work as well with a choir, and I ask them to recreate with their voices the sound of the sirens of the sheep, to bring the sheep back to the to the town and return the life to the town. Uh, can we play the video, please? Is the third video. Okay, um, the next project that I want to show is Ephemeral Monuments, which is a project that I did in uh, La Habana, Cuba in 2019. And um, it's, um, it, it points out the correspondence between the physical and emotional resistance of a body, uh, of the body of athletes in this uh, specific uh, case, and the collapse, on, the collapse of the entire environment. Havana, it's a city that it's in decay. Um, and the, all of the sports facilities are just falling apart in a very terrible way. Um, they are extremely beautiful uh, as an architectonic point of view, but they're just falling in, in pieces. Um, as well, the support of the athletes fall apart. So I decided to create this piece, which is based in um, this book. I had this book um, many years ago, and this is a book from 1969, published in Mexico City. Mexico City was, um, in, in 1968, Mexico was uh, the head of the, uh, of the Olympics. So we have our Olympics in, in 68, and it was a very difficult moment all over the world and as well in Mexico. Um, uh, the Olympics um, 
were used as a way to cover and make up all what was happening in the country. Uh, there was a lot of social problems. And so I found in this book, this little beautiful drawings of bodies doing equilibrium at, and creating this kind of ephemeral monuments. Uh, for me, this, this um, position of the body uh, talks about how can you, you depend on the other one for an equilibrium. You work all together. You have to lay down in the other one, trust the other one, because if not, everything falls apart. Uh, so I remake these poses with a group of athletes in this um, amazingly beautiful but falling apart installation. Can we see um, the fragment of the video, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, based in this interest in, in architecture and buildings, um, this is another project that, uh, that started with the history of a building as a museum in Mexico City, which is called El Museo del Chopo, that actually it used to be in Europe and one was transported by ship uh, to Mexico and reinstall it over here. The, um, the museum was made by Eiffel. But um, I wanted to, re to honor the history of the museum, creating um, a balloon, a captive balloon, which was part of the history of the world fairs as well uh, during the 19th century. In Taller de Confección, my main interest as well was to show the moment of, uh, of manufacturing uh, as a piece of, as a performance piece, as a piece of art in the context of the museum. So for that, um, after seeing these photos, uh, I decided to install for a month this sewing workshop in the museum with the two industrial machines for these two women, which are, um, they are professional balloon makers. So um, they were there from during eight, eight hours a day, like a diary, um, regular um, working time. And the sound of the work and the movements of them uh, while sewing create this choreography, um, the basis of the choreography of labor, series of projects. In the back, uh, I installed the patterns of the balloon and um, they bring the whole workshop over there and they were recreating the thing. So can we play the small fragment of the video please? Because it's, it's beautiful to hear how it sounds and how the process of while doing the work is just like a ballet.
Okay, so um, they were working for a month um, to create this balloon, and um, this was the, the inspiration of the whole project. This and the photos of the of the um, the workshop, the old photos. Um, as you can, as everyone can see, the balloons were captured inside these beautiful structures, and these. Um, looks very much as the as the museum so um, i decided to recreate this idea of of having this technology uh kept there without without any use and um at the end is a reflection of of how we do with technologies we tend to declare them obsolete and start putting attention of them they are not we don't, we never honor the old technologies in the way I believe uh, we should. And for me, all technologies and all inventions are always uh, um, super, super inspiring. Um, it, they, they make me um, guess how and when the moment of the first idea came up. So how in, how was, created how what happened in the mind of the inventor for create this idea of flying no um, can we play the small video it's just like a 40 seconds video so we can all see how the balloon was um, um, flew inside the museum Yeah. Okay. I'm here now. Yes. Yes. Um, and this is um, another piece. This is from 2015, um, which is as well about this flying artifact. I did um, a, a, a long research on different attempts of the of the men, of the men to create flying devices. And this one, uh, the one that we are seeing, looking at, it's, it, was cre it was invented by a um, locksmith from France called Besnier in 1673. Uh, and for me, it's very interesting because it doesn't look like, like wings at all. Many of the other inventions tend to be more like, a, like um, bird wings or butterfly wings or or balloons, but in this case, this kind of palette that just flip flop, it, it was just, uh, it just made me very curious. And the story with this guy is that he uh, actually built them and start doing tests from, from first from a table, then from the top of the, of their cab, of his cabin, then from a bridge to the water. 
And then when he tried, he made a try from the, um, the church, uh, he unfortunately died. So um, um, I recreate the, the invention, I remake it, and I was super lucky to be invited for this project, which is called La Gravedad de los Asuntos, The Matters of Gravity, in 2015, where a group of uh, artists, eight artists in total and one scientist, we went to uh, Russia and in Moscow, we visited the, the place, this place where the cosmonauts uh, train um, themselves. So, um, so we were there and we flew in um, this kind of plane, which is called Illusin, where the cosmonauts train themselves to feel the zero gravity. And I was able to test the machine in zero gravity environment. So I made it work. Um, this was a very important project for all of us because we all were having an experience which is literally uh, out of this world because we are not used to not feeling gravity. Uh, the project was, uh, um, the intention was to each of the artists, we needed to uh, have an idea for a piece um, and made the piece in the, during the free fall, which last 30 seconds. So we had 10 free falls during the whole flight. The flight was uh, three hours in total. And each artist has 30 seconds to make their own project. And then we help to the other artist. Um, this is another of the projects that was made by Ivan Puig. This is the faces of all of us um, feeling the zero gravity. I'm the one, the one, two, three, four, five, I'm the sixth, I'm super happy. <laughs> it was a very strange sensation. And we did a, a, a piece in collaboration with the idea of bringing a piñata into the, into the, um, into this environment. Can we please play the video? It is kind of long, it's a quite long video, so I don't know how about the time. So, John.
It's almost done. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the water, how it is. We're back. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, let's let's start the chat with Cespo. I would love to hear if you have any questions or commentaries. Thank you very much. Gracias, Tanya. Gracias, Cespo. <laughs> so that's me. myself and enjoying myself with the Vesnie uh, apparatus. <laughs> Um, we'll, um, I'll ask some questions, but anybody in the, in the chat, anybody streaming, um, please type something in, um, and I'll be sure to pass it along to Tanya, but maybe I'll start, um, by asking you, um, you touched on it on, in certain different projects that you presented, but maybe if you could just talk a little bit more of like the order of your process and when an idea comes to you like is it it's very site specific so does it when you know of a place that you're going to be exhibiting do, do you then begin to like think of something for you to kind of like investigate or like you know or is it how much does budget play into it like I, I guess I'm just curious as to like how you're like mapping all of yeah. these parts out and then how you then navigate the compromises, you know, where it's like, I can't do this, but maybe I could do this. Um, yes. And then, and then my follow up would be like, where does that turn into then like productivity for you? What was the last one? The productivity? Yeah. yeah in the kind of like negotiating the compromises and the yeses and the nos and the. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a it's a it's a very interesting question, and actually, uh, when we uh, uh, play the last video, um, mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's a it's a mute video, I started to chatting, and I was exactly talking about all this. Is like um, my practice is very it's very different. I mean, I have a, a, a body of works that goes in different directions uh, because I'm very curious. Um, the way I research, I, it's very serendipity. It's very serendipic um, with um, chance encounters. And I'm very open to finding things in the way and allowed me to keep that instead of other things. But if I'm, for example, if I'm working in a specific project, because yes, it's true, um, I'm, I, I really enjoy the site specifics. And while working inside a specific, I, if I'm not able to visit the place in um, first, for example, if I'm applying for a residency, which involves a, a project for, for the specific, for the place, I made a research online uh, first and always trying to get some narrative on it because uh, there's a lot of tales in, in my work. I'm, I'm, very fond of, of, of histories. So I just grab into that and, and it's not that I'm just start researching for looking some specific, it's more just reading to see in which moment I will be hit with something that really moves me. Uh, once that happened, I start digging more and finding ways um, for example if there's a if there's a place where a community of of uh, woodworking or uh, or como se dice artes de carpinteros of or 
or if in that place there's a tradition of, I don't know, fishing. So I try to look for those stories and recover that in my work. And in that way, I create a narrative first. And then from that first narrative, just the ideas of pieces start to mm. coming up. No, mm, there's mm. a lot of video in the recent, in the last years, probably in the last three years more, because a video gives me gives me the the whole package. I think it has the possibility of telling a story. So the script can be very important. There's a narrative. There's um, there's literature. I mean, there's a the literary component in the script. There's the visual, of course, uh, and the choreographic, and the, it, it exists the landscape. It can you, you allow to have links between real images and images that you are creating, mm -hmm. and of course, this, the sound is over there. So with sound, you create a kind of fifth wall, like you mm -hmm. you are able to create um, a room within the same room. Mm. Like if you're in a room and you have a sound of a factory, then suddenly you are transported to a to a factory instead of being kept over there. No, mm -hmm. um, about the um, how can I how I plan the um, the budget? It depends. Um, I um, it depends the uh, the kind of the project, the way I think, I, um, mm -hmm. the way I think the production. Um, all the projects are based on, in different kind of collaborations. Um, so um, working in collaboration has mean, of course, um, of course means uh, fees and honoraries for all that people. So it depends the budget, the amount of people that I can invite to be part of, of it. Um, but, but sometimes you are, um, you can find a way to trace connections and, um, Work in collaboration with it without having a lot of budget. It depends. It's a negotiation mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. and um, that's part of of the creative uh, labor of an artist as well. So research right. is a creative part. Then collaborating is another super rich uh, and huge part of the project, and then deciding, then producing, and uh, then finally just. Um, delivering and waiting for the people to be touched by the by the by the pieces. No? Yeah, you you said um, at, in um, the earlier piece, uh, camouflage, that you saw the photo of a uh, Dorothy Ling and that you wanted to rescue this this image and um, bring back the history. And I, I I like that, and I I think of that throughout all, all your projects. Um, and something I wrote down, it's like you, I noticed the trend of you trying to bring to life an image, some kind of drawing. And I think all these different kinds of media, sound, video, allows you to bring that kind of image or that kind of time to life. Um, so I just wanted to make that connection from something you had said earlier. Um, yes. Um, I have a question here from someone. Um, I'll just read it out loud from one of the students here at the University of Chicago, which uh, says, the vocals of the choir piece in Cincinnati were very exciting. Did the vocals of all the singers come out as you'd imagine they would, or were there lots of changes along the way? How did your composer translate the sound of the indus industry of the past to the voices of the Cincinnati choir? Was that translation yeah. process difficult? Yeah, it was, it was very difficult, very fun. Um, I visited the composer, uh, my friend, and he's, he was like, okay, tell me about the project. And then he said, like, Tanya, I need to record you <laughs> doing the sound of the industries because I don't know what you have in mind. So he just put me in the studio, in the audio studio, and make me recreate that. I, was, I had in mind very clear, like, for example, in the case of the, there's four industries. So it's the meatpacking the iron industry, the printing industry, and the woodworking. So the meatpacking was very um, literal. Like in the, you, you first see the, the, the pigs, and then the pigs 
enter into the slaughterhouse and then they kill the porks and then they remove the skin and then they are cut it. So he said, okay, make the noises for me. So I was doing the... Ah! <laughs> uh, so I did that with the four industries and and once he understood the way I was picturing the narrative, because it was a narrative, it was like a walk through the factory and and hearing, being in the middle of the machines and the machinery. Um, so then he started, uh, he, he created this uh, set sets of of hits and times. It it was more about rhythm. Uh, so the uh, in that case, the, the director of the choir was able to hear and say, for example, there's time from here to here. We have to do this, and the second group will do that, and the third group will do that. And now it's a change. Now it's a silence. Mm. And then he records videos doing the sounds for them. So it was kind of the same thing, like um, sound G. <laughs> that can be done with blah, blah, blah. So I sent this course to, to um, Gillian, that's the name of the director, very friend, uh, very close friend now. <laughs> we work a lot in the distance. So I sent her this course and she programmed the rehearsals. And when I finally went there for the recording, which was in December last year, the beginning of December, she invited me to the um, rehearsal. But the rehearsal in the choir are almost without sound. They just mark the score because they don't want to, uh, um, I don't know, este, lastimar, uh, to hurt the, the, mm. the throat. Uh, so... There was no sound, so I didn't know how it sounds. I was super, super worried. And the following day, there was the the recording session programmed. So we have the, the call for the recording. So once we were all setting with the cameras, with the lights, and the whole production were there, then the, the choir came in, and they finally opened the mouth with all the voice. And that was the moment when I heard the sound. Mm -hmm. So it was just super, uh, <laughs> it was crazy. I enjoy it. Uh, and it turns out amazing. I mean, uh, we did a, a, just not very much in the, in the editing, in the sound mm -hmm. editing at the end, because we were working with quadraphonic sound. So we were able to place, for example, more voices in the back. So yes, we do that, for example, uh, um, making more strong and bold some sounds, but we just we just decided which one of the of the shoots were were better, um, and that's how it worked. Yeah, the <laughs> scores the scores are part of the exhibition as well. So there it's the the scores that was written by Rogelio with some drawings and my annotations, which says, for example, chik chik chik, it's written down like that. Because mm -hmm. I don't write music. I'm not a musician either. I'm not an engineer or a musician or an artist, <laughs> like a former artist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as I told you in the morning when we chat, mm -hmm. that uh, sometimes it's difficult. I am invited to, to make conferences to universities, um, always with artists that are being trained as an artist. And... I was not trained as an artist, so it's just a very different way and an empirical way and empirical approach to making things. That for that I decided to start it with Tijuana because Tijuana uh, uh, just showed me how things were possible. There was no no nos. There was everything was possible. We can just create together and make a remix and have a party, and that party is the piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's very um i would say it's your your work even though it's there's so many parts it's very kind of practical it's like okay this and then i have this and then i try these few things and then now i have this pile of stuff and then now all of a sudden it's like sound and then dance and then we try this and dance and then we you know it's very practical but it's very um it just generates a lot you know, a lot, of, and I think remixing, you know, the, that's how you describe your practice. I think it's a very um, interesting way of thinking it, of like going back and forth. Um, 
and just discovering new kind creating accidents of you know playful accidents that then <laughs> drive the project even further and further for us um yeah i think i think the the joy it's 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 super super important mm -hmm. i mean um i started as a painter and when i was painting i was always in pain it it hurt it was um it didn't feel good for me. It was just like, well, I was suffering all the time. And from when I decided to quit painting, I started drawing with a sewing machine, a very old singer that I, ha that I have. I still have it. I have five sewing machines. I just love them. Um, and switch the thing. So I, my body was part of the drawing and that just gave me this feeling of, this this feels right. It feels mm -hmm. yummy. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So maybe to to um, this ties to the next question, and maybe this could be our last one. Um, yeah. What is it? The, or how have you been? Maybe finding that same kind of joy and newness in tools, or you know, not being beholden to your own rules now. Um, now that you're in that we're all in this kind of quarantine, you know, like what, what are things that you're doing now that you're not able to like hear the voices in person and be there? Like what kinds of practices, how has it changed, you know? Yeah, it was very complicated. Uh, the first three months were really tough mm -hmm. and more because uh, it was, I was doing the, the post-production of this big piece, the four industries. And as well, I was doing um, the, the final two pieces for another show, which is up now in the Arizona State University Museum, which is called For the Animals, um, which is as well based in video. It's a, it's a three channel video, but with a 5.1 audio. Mm. So again, it was just this lack of, I, I was not able to, even though, um, not even to, to imagine how that would sound, but what I find out, for example, doing um, for work with my editor, I just found this new way of doing um, storyboards. So I create mm -hmm. a new version of a storyboard that ended up a kind of uh, of book. It it just I just create a new way of working, and it was it was I was super happy doing that. Um, I've been uh, reading a lot, so. I'm just finding new ways of 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 working from home because I was actually um, more than um, eight months a year out of home traveling mm -hmm. doing projects. So now this now it's it's um, this thing that creating from home has been challenging, but there's many things that I have to do from here. I'm now involved in another project. Uh, consisted in create works in the environment of video games. Um, I never play video games before in my life because I thought it was a waste of time. But no, now I'm just um, entering into this new metaverse, uh, this new understanding of realities in the digital world, which is it's just huge. It's just um, it's very interesting. But at the same time, trying to connect that with this way of thinking about nature and our the, the necessity to be connected with the with the nature and with the world and with the solidarity and the humans, animals, uh, earth. So I'm in that process <laughs> <laughs> continuously. I'm, um, yeah. Um, I spend so many hours in front of the computer. That's the only bad thing about it. I really miss to do things with my hands, just embroider or whatever. No. <laughs> well, I think that's perfect. Then maybe we've uh, time for all of us to step away from the from the computer for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for for joining, and yeah. thank you, Tanya. Yeah, thank you very much for 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 be here. Um, I'm sorry, I was. I was a bit nervous and it was very difficult for me to speak just looking at the monitor and I was not looking at myself. So I was kind of very distracted. I, I really hope that 
it was uh, a bit understandable. <laughs> if you're curious about the work, I'm my my website. It was updated and it's now up. It's myname.com, www.taniacandiani.com. So if you are curious, there's a lot of links to videos and please do. <laughs> thank Gracias. you, Sara. Thank you, John. Thank you, Zespel. <laughs> Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Festival. Good night. Good night. <laughs>